For the next 31 days on the FCPA Compliance Report, we're going to be bringing you a daily tip, strategy, or idea that you can use to improve your program. Here's your host, Tom Fox, the Compliance Evangelist. I'm often asked about the franchise or liability under the FCPA. Franchising has been a successful model in the United States, and now many corporations are looking at overseas expansion opportunities through franchising. Franchise law has become well-developed across the United States, with many states developing laws to protect the rights and obligations of both parties in a franchise agreement. According to a 2008 survey from the International Franchise Association nearly of nearly 1,600 franchise systems, two-thirds of respondents currently franchise and operate in non-U.S. markets, and three-quarters have a plan to do so by in initiating international expansion. There are no reported FCPA enforcement actions regarding franchisors. However, the factors in a franchise relationship would lead one to, clear, to conclude that clear FCPA responsibility of a franchisor for the overseas actions of its franchisees. Additionally, court interpretations of the FCPA have held that it is applicable where the conduct violative of the act is used to obtain or retain business or to secure an important business advantage which can cover almost any kind of advantage, including indirect monetary advantage, even as nebulous as reputational advantage. As everyone knows, FCPA and the FCPA prohibits payments to foreign officials or to state-owned enterprise employees to obtain or retain business or secure to an improper business advantage. Nevertheless, many U.S. companies view franchisees as different from other types of business ventures. I believe that such an analysis is misguided as the DOJ takes the position that a U.S. company's responsibilities extend to, the, to a wide range of third parties, vis, business venture partners, including sales agents, representatives, resellers, joint venture partners, distributors, teaming partners, alliance partners, and many of the groups that we've been exploring this month. It does not take too great a leap of imagination to see that a franchise relationship could be easily contained within this interpretation. Further, it does not take too many legal steps to see that a franchisee's actions can impute FCPA liability to a U.S. franchisor's, to a U.S. franchisor. There are other factors unique to the franchise relationship which would, which would point to FCPA liability of a U.S. franchisor. The U.S. franchisor's antenna control it exercises over the oversized franchisee's operations are factors the DOJ and SEC might consider in determining whether to pursue an FCPA case against a franchisor for bribes made by one of its foreign officials. It is always in the financial interest of a U.S. franchise or for its franchisees to be successful businesses as their income increases with the income of the franchisee. Additionally, most U.S. franchisors require overseas franchisees to use the same company name for branding. Not only the initial franchise fee, but the franchisee's monthly royalty payment roll up into the books and records of a franchisor. So this might well catch the attention of the SEC if they're simply a books and records violation. While many franchisors have thorough financial vetting requirements before any allowing any person or business to become a franchisee, how many of these same businesses perform full FCPA compliance due diligence on prospective overseas franchisees? How many U.S. franchisors have FCPA compliance training programs? How many evaluate on an ongoing basis the FCPA compliance program of their oversize, excuse me, overseas franchisees? And how many U.S. franchisors have compliance hotlines or other reporting mechanisms for any compliance violation allegation made against a franchisor? So what are the types of franchise relationships which could lead to potential FCPA liability? International franchising models include the direct or unit sale franchising, and this is the oldest and, most, and arguably most commonly used model where the franchisor sells one or more of its units at a time and has direct involvement with the franchisee. There is no third party involved in the operations between the franchisor and franchisee. Therefore, it is the franchisor's responsibility to handle training, marketing, supplies, and other support tasks to the franchisee rather than outsourcing this task. And here you can clearly see the potential FCPA exposure. Another model is 
the area development or multi-unit franchising. In this type of model, the U.S.-based franchisor employs an area developer who operates or controls multiple local franchises in a specified area, sometimes with an exclusive area. If the franchisor uses his model, then there will likely be faster growth than is seen with the direct or single unit franchising model. Typically, area developers are sophisticated business persons and have knowledge about the particular territory where the franchisor is interested or have a better ability to find out about the territory. Oftentimes, the area developer has one agreement with the franchisor and a separate agreement with the area franchisees. This differs from the direct or single unit model, and utilizing an area development approach can be financially beneficial to the domestic or U.S. franchisor because the area developer bear some of the financial burden for paying the expenditures. But here, once again, you can see the potential FCPA exposure with the third-party representative or the third party between the franchisor and franchisee. Finally is master franchising, which is the most common expansion method used in international franchise. This method usually involves a contract between a U.S. domestic franchisor and a master franchisee in a particular area that then contracts with third-party sub-franchisees within the specific territory. Frequently, the U.S. domestic franchisor will have no contractual relationship with the sub-franchisees. The master franchise effectively acts as a franchisor in the local market and will recruit, research, train, and provide other support in the local area on behalf of the domestic franchisor. And here, this clearly demonstrates the potential FCPA exposure by turning over the function to the master franchisor in the area in question. So you can clearly see potential liability for U.S. domestic franchisors, but the franchising models, I think, lend themselves to also an FCPA or bribery and corruption. So what are today's three key takeaways? Number one, consider the different types of international franchise agreements to help assess your FCPA compliance risk. The master franchising agreement is going to be different than the single unit agreement, which may be different from the area development or multi-unit franchising agreement. Two, while there are no reported FCPA enforcement actions involving international U.S. domestic franchisors, does not mean that there are not some coming down the road and be prepared. Three, franchisors must conduct thorough research in the foreign markets they hope to enter on their potential franchisees and the franchisees of your franchisees. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox. I'd like to thank you again for joining me for this episode of 31 Days to a More Effective Compliance Program around business ventures. And I hope you will join me for our next episode tomorrow. This podcast series on 31 Days to a More Effective Compliance Program is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network.